Hi, my name is Evan Carter. I'm a reporter with Michigan Capital Confidential. And today I'm joined by Dr. Jim Hines, who's a Republican candidate for governor. Thank you for being with us today, Dr. Hines. Hey, it's great to be here. Thanks, Evan. To start things off, um, tell us a little bit about yourself. What brought you to Michigan and what do you think is the best part about living in the state? Wow, that's a loaded question. I'm a, I'm a medical doctor and a former missionary to the Central African Republic and a small business owner. And uh, what brought me here was training. After I had uh, come back from Africa, I ran two hospitals there. Uh, I felt like I needed more education. And so I came to the uh, Michigan State University branch program in Saginaw, and I did a residency in OBGYN. So moving into policy topics now, um, over the past number of years, the state of Michigan has given out about a billion dollars out of their general fund every year in select tax credits to certain businesses. And then last year they passed two more tax credit packages. Was this a good move or is this a bad move? Well, in my opinion, it was a bad move. And I, I think that the, the best economic thing that we can do in this state uh, is to de decrease taxes. Uh, decrease taxes for individuals and for uh, for businesses, for job providers. When when you start picking winners and losers, more often than not, you're you're wrong. You're off. And I think there's some great examples of that right here in Michigan: solar, batteries, film, where you think something is or a business is going to be great and and it's going to uh, produce a great economic benefit for the state, and it turns out not to be. Mm -hmm. um, it actually reminds me of Henry Ford because imagine if you uh, had a horse and buggy business back in 1901, 1905 and uh, you uh, asked for a subsidy for your business and uh, not knowing that Henry Ford would produce the first car in, in 1908. Sure. You know, and so we've seen that over and over again here in uh, Michigan and uh, you alluded to a couple of... Um, uh, new entities, uh, Michigan Thrive and Good Jobs. Yes, yep. And uh, I would have voted, uh, voted against them. And one of the reasons I would have voted against them is because I, I believe that it, it cherry picks or it poaches workers. So, for example, uh, when you start a, a new business and, and you're anticipating two, three hundred workers, or in the case of Amazon, 50,000 workers, we have holes in every sector in our job market here in Michigan right now. We're okay. short 100,000 skilled trade jobs. And so where are you gonna get the workers? If, if you could bring those workers from other states, I'd be delighted, it would be great. But the fact of the matter is we don't have the workers. We don't have, our unemployment rate is as lowest as it's been in 17 years. And so we don't have the workers to fill those jobs. And that's probably one of the reasons that Amazon did not choose to come to Detroit because of the lack of talent, among other things. So uh, I'm not for picking winners and losers. I'm for decreasing taxes across the board for everybody, make, make the uh, job market uh, look really, uh, be good and look good for everybody, not just certain entities. Sure. Now you talked about I'm for decreasing taxes. Um, sort of a thorny issue in the past couple of years has been the state's income tax rate. Right now it's at 4.25% uh, last yes. time I checked. Yes. Um, it used to be at 3.9%, then it went up to 4.35 and went down. Mm -hmm. But it's sort of been stuck at 4.25% for, for a little bit. If you were the governor of Michigan, would you sign legislation that returns the income tax rate back down to 39 I, I would to fulfill a, a promise from Granholm who increased it to 4.35 to, to get it down to 3.9. But uh, we, we would have to be careful even doing that because, sure. first of all, I think fiscal responsibility is critically important for the governing of the state. So we need to be responsible with the funds that we have. And so I would say that, that I would be for um, control or uh, taxes in regulations and spending under control and decrease taxes when we can. So that decrease in taxes that you brought up from 4.25 to 3.9, it's, it's about 250 million for every one-tenth of a percent change in the income tax. And so that's $875 million. 
And so on the surface, it sounds great. Let's, mm -hmm. let's decrease it to 3.9, but we have to realize if we're going to be fiscally responsible, that that's going to, that's going to create a hole somewhere. And so you have to look at your budget and, and sure. figure out you know what you can do without uh, or what you can change to come up with the money that will be required so that you can have a balanced budget. Okay. Changing gears a little bit, um, as governor, um, the state executive would have to deal with a number of issues, one of those being uh, the criminal justice system. Are there any specific reforms you think are needed in the criminal justice system? What, what are your thoughts um, about those issues? Um, of course, uh, our budget is $2 billion a year in, in, in that category. And uh, by the way, I have a son who is a police officer in Dayton, Ohio. And so we, we talk uh, and compare notes quite a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things is the um, civil forfeiture uh, where uh, a, at a, a, there's a police raid and they confiscate all of the goods for whatever reason and uh, they keep them even though the individual uh, has not been convicted of a crime or if, if uh, they go through the process are found to be innocent it can be very difficult to get those items back and I think that uh, when you look at um, uh, seizing someone's property, you're, you're messing with the Fourth Amendment. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that that, that needs to be changed. I, instead of civil forfeiture, I think it should be criminal forfeiture okay. when you're convicted of a crime. So that's an area that needs to be changed. Uh, the recidivism rate has dropped over the years. I think it peaked out at around 45% in 1998 or 1999. And it's down to about 29%. But I, I think that it can go even lower, and there are programs that have been utilized uh, successfully to bring that rate down even more. Okay. Um, our prison system is very expensive, and so if we could get that rate down even to 20% or 10%, I think it's possible with uh, organizations like uh, Operation Transformation, uh, Open Door, where someone who has been in prison and comes out they they perhaps don't have a job they don't have education mm -hmm. they have no money they don't have food they're going to go back to what maybe got them in jail in the first place and so what these programs do is uh, they become a mentor and a coach for those individuals and uh, we even had uh, one of the uh, operation transformation prisoners uh, work for us oh. under under the uh, guidance of a coach and mentor and so i've seen it firsthand be successful in work and i think we could decrease that rate, which would decrease even further our prison population, and uh, that would save us. That would save us money. Um, uh, another area uh, would be uh, bonds, and uh, so it, it, if a professional were to uh, do something illegal, and it's a thousand dollar bond, ah, and uh, cash bonds, cash bonds, yes, yes, okay. cash bonds, and. You know, I could pay the thousand dollars, sure. But someone on Medicaid or someone with a low income is not going to be able to pay that, and they're going to end up spending time in jail. Um, and then there's the driver's responsibility issue too, with the driver responsibility fees. With the fees, mm -hmm. because uh, those individuals, uh, the fees can be tremendous, and and uh, so they either, if they uh, don't want to drive illegally, mm -hmm. you know then uh, they have problems getting a job uh, if the job is further than they can walk and then uh, or they drive illegally so that's an issue that needs to be dealt with mm -hmm. okay now changing gears a little bit again to the state's environment um, so in 2008 former governor Jennifer Granholm signed the uh, renewable energy standard uh, that says that in the state of Michigan by 2015 we have to get 10 percent of our energy from renewable sources. Then in 2016, Governor Snyder expanded that. He signed into law a requirement that 15% of the state's energy be gotten from renewable sources. Was this a good move or is this um, a bad move? It's a bad move. And uh, I love renewable energy. Uh, when I worked in Africa for the four years, we solarized both hospitals, we solarized our house, and we solarized about six or seven of our urgent care facilities. And this was good because I was tired of doing delivery, delivering babies and doing surgeries with flashlight. Sure. Uh, but we could not have afforded it if we'd had to purchase all the solar panels. 
So we had a subsidy. And uh, the individual that, that purchased all those for us, they purchased them and we did the wiring and we did the mm -hmm. brackets and so forth. And so uh, I would, if, if uh, renewable energies are so good, as the proponents say, then why not get rid of the subsidies and the mandates? And okay. so I would be a proponent for getting rid of subsidies, getting rid of mandates, and let the open market, the free market, decide what's going to happen with our renewables. So beyond the standard step by the state of Michigan, a number of those subsidies are set at the federal level. Mm -hmm. Other than the um, uh, mandates set at the state level for getting 15%, of our electricity use um, from renewable sources, what else would you change then um, beyond the subsidies, which many of which are from the federal level? Well, I hear a lot of complaints as I travel the state. I live in Saginaw, and of course the thumb is right there, and there's a number of uh, windmill farms. Mm -hmm. And so I hear a lot of complaints from farmers and individuals because of the noise and so forth. So um, there, there are issues, and, and um, actually quite a few issues uh, sure. with those uh, individuals. Um, I, I, again, I like wind power, I like solar power, but of course, they're not completely dependable. Okay. And they're not always producing. So when the sun's not out, when the wind's not blowing, then you, know, you have issues with the amount of energy that's being produced. And so that's, that's another issue um, that I think needs to be taken into account. When you say, well, my farm will, will um, produce the electricity for uh, 5,000 houses, it won't do it. 24 7 right it will do it when the wind's blowing and uh, so that's a, another issue you still need other forms of energy so whether it's fossil fuels or nuclear uh, or whatever it, it's, it's not an independent source and so I'm speaking from someone who's used solar I had a solar house I love solar but it it's expensive Another issue that um, a governor would have to face is energy prices. Um, electricity in Michigan is, on average, for a consumer, the most expensive of any Midwestern state, according to the government agency that tracks those numbers. If you were the governor, what would you do to lower the resident electricity rates in Michigan? Oh, Evan, this is a, this is a, that's a, that's a, you know almost an impossible question. Okay, you have an oligopoly here in Michigan. Uh, you have renewables coming into it. Uh, I received a letter from uh, someone in the UP complaining of the prices there. I mean, they are so high. I was going to ask you today, <laughs> you know, how, how do I how do I answer uh, the individuals in the UP in the UP that are mm -hmm. paying so much, much more than we are paying in the lower uh, peninsula uh, for their energy costs. And uh, so I think that's going to require a, a team of individuals to look at that and try to find ways to decrease the energy. And um, uh, because if you just talk to Detroit Electric and consumers, uh, everything looks on the up and up, but yet it's mm -hmm. so expensive. And uh, so some of it might be what can the consumers do to decrease their energy usage? So that, I think that's part of it. Uh, how they can consume energy, uh, not utilize it, but uh, the conservation part of energy, turning off lights, um, windows that that keep you know the heat in, doors that are closed and seals and so forth. So these are individual these are individual things that consumers need to be aware of. And and we all know, and I I know I have a leaky mm -hmm. door in my house, and I just have been lazy and haven't fixed it. But I just got my energy bill today. And it's $100 more than I expected. So now I'm thinking, oh, so no more fireplace and let's fix the, the gaskets that are leaking, mm -hmm. leaking that heat. Okay, as you've traveled the state and as you've researched in, in sort of your campaign, what would you say is the biggest issue facing the state of Michigan today? I think it's a combination of jobs, education, and infrastructure. I would call these foundational things that have to be in order for us to keep our families together in Michigan and to draw families in Michigan. My wife and I have been married for 43 years and we have seven sons oh, wow. and five of our sons have all 15 of my grandchildren and not a one of them lives in Michigan hmm. for job reasons and education reason, reasons. Um, and Job reasons, it, you know, 
to, to, to be a family and to be successful, you have to have more than just a, a paycheck. Sure. You can't be living paycheck to paycheck. Um, you have to make enough so that you can pay your bills, so that you can invest, so that you can budget, so that you can prepare for college for your kids and so forth. And so we need to, we need to increase the amount of money that people are getting here in Michigan. So that involves education. And uh, I think we're stymied just a little bit. We have a large group of kids that aren't learning to read. We have high school graduates that are heading off to college. Mm -hmm. uh, they're like being pushed to college. The career counselors are saying, oh, you know, you need to go to college. And you have parents who say, hey, you know, I want all my kids to go to college, even though their aptitude may not be there. Sure. And so uh, this is an issue because a third of college freshmen have to take remedial classes. So this increases the cost of education, this increases the length of study in schools, and uh, kids are pushed to college, they don't know what they want to major at, so they end up taking longer to complete if they complete, and half of our college students don't complete within okay. six years. And so um, it, it's an issue of jobs, education, and then our infrastructure. I mean, who would want to live in, in Michigan if you don't have clean, drinkable water? or mm -hmm. you don't have roads to drive on, or your sewage systems are broken. And we're putting a, over a billion gallons of sewage, raw sewage and partially treated sewage, into our rivers and lakes. And so I'm saying that I love Michigan. Mm -hmm. I'm a hunter, I'm a runner, uh, I love to fish, um, I have a boat, a wave runner. Uh, with all my kids, you would imagine that I would have a lot of those types of things, and mm -hmm. I do. I love Michigan, but as governor, we want to we want to attract families and we want to keep families here, and so these are these are the three biggest areas. One er since you ask, sure. one one area that I think that is extremely problematic is the opioid healthcare crisis, and as you know, I'm a doctor, and so this is near and dear to my heart. Uh, my son is the policeman, as I said, he carries the antidote and naloxone in his pocket, and we want to save lives. We have over 100 people dying every day from opioid overdose, and we're, we're trying to deal with it by limiting the use of opioids, which I think is, is good, it's great, but the problem is, is that when you take someone's opioids away, they're addicted. Their brain thinking is broken they will go to heroin or fentanyl. Otherwise, they're gonna go through opioid withdrawal, which is horrendously bad. I mean, it's bad, very bad. And um, so we have to be careful that we fund for the um, addiction counseling and medication use to get someone healed, get their brain healed. And that process is a process. It's more than a week, it's more than two weeks. It's one to two years, so once you're addicted, there is a process that you need to go through, and we don't have enough physicians to, to meet that need, and so we need more funding, and we need more addiction, we call them addictionologists. So this is someone who specializes in addiction uh, issues with individuals, and they're very good at it, but we don't have enough providers to handle that, and so that really needs the attention uh, of our governor and of the state. Well, Dr. Hines, thank you so much okay. for being in here and talking with us today. Great. Um, stay tuned. In the next couple of months, we will be speaking with a number of uh, gubernatorial candidates. You can see more news and interviews like this one at micapcon.com or by looking up Michigan Capital Confidential on Facebook. Mm -hmm.